Amen. You can have a seat. All right, so I've got a boat up here, and now I have a giant beach ball. So who knows what I'm going to have next week? <laughs> All right, so we've been looking at a passage of Scripture, and I'm going to have you actually turn there. So if you need a Bible, raise your hand, because we got Bibles. And we get a Bible in your hand, like, real quick. So raise your hand. Robin, I'll get you a Bible. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 14. Okay, Matthew chapter 14. The name of this series is Water Walkers. And it all centers around this um, event that took place in Peter's life. And we've been kind of unpacking this whole event that took place. And so tonight we're going to look at a different aspect of this, but I want us to go over the story again. Um, all of these verses will not be on the screen. I'm just going to read through this, and then we're going to go back to where we're going to center on, all right? But it's actually, we're going to go from Matthew 14, starting in verse 22. Listen to what this says, okay? It says, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back in the boat and cross the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from the land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, It's a ghost! But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's you really, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat, walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. All right, we're going to pray. Because see, here's the, here's the reality. As we're talking about having the faith to get out of a boat, get out of this boat, okay, and walk towards Jesus. As we're talking about that, as we're unpacking all of that, I know full well the fear that fills every single one of us, including me, when we think about taking a risk, stepping out of the boat. I'm very well aware of that, and so is Jesus. And so tonight, as we unpack this a little further, my prayer for you and what I want to pray for us is that we are willing to kind of move, put the fear, set it aside, and let's think about how awesome it would be if we were able to actually experience walking on water. What would that be like? All right, so let's pray. Jesus, thank you for my friends here tonight. I pray, Holy Spirit, would you teach us? We need to know the truth tonight. We need to be inspired tonight, and we need to be challenged tonight. And so I pray that as we look at your living and powerful word, um, I pray that you would use it to uh, ignite our hearts, continue to um, fan into flame that uh, torch that you lit in us the second we put our faith in Jesus, your light comes on the inside of us. And Jesus, so I pray that tonight we would not only be inspired, but we would be challenged and we would be willing to step out of the boat. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, last week we talked about the 11 dis disciples who decided to stay in the boat. And we called them boat potatoes. In fact, there was somebody that said, Pastor Pat, you should have filled this boat with potatoes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, no. 
Um, but it, that reminds me, you know, getting out and doing something crazy reminds me, okay, I used to work for a photo lab, all right? And I used to have to drive. It was a one-hour photo lab. When the, you guys remember when one-hour photo labs existed, right? Okay. I used to work for a place called Taylor Photo. I don't know if you guys ever remember Taylor Photo. They had two locations in Toledo and one in Finley. And I worked at the one in Finley. And so I was the uh, supervisor guy there, whatever. And so, um, but the owner, okay, so the owner was kind of a different kind of character. I remember having a conversation with him once, and he said, I always knew that I was either going to be a thief or a pastor. <laughs> and so he decided to go in the middle and become a businessman. All right? So he's, he's this business guy. And this guy was crazy. This guy was crazy what he would do and so he learned how to do a bunch of stuff like he learned how to fly hot air balloon like I did that with him once but probably the craziest thing the most exhilarating thing that I did he had a mini helicopter he would fly around okay and you're like a mini helicopter what's that well it's the size of helicopter that we could land in our parking lot right here okay and the whole part front of the whole thing was a big glass bubble okay so you're in this big glass bubble, so you see everything that's going on, right? So he decided, he landed it at the Finley location and asked me if I wanted to go for a ride, right? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, okay, he's my boss. I guess I don't want to get fired or anything, you know? So, so we get inside there or whatever, and he's in there, and he's telling me some different things or whatever, and we take off, right? <laughs> You know, we go up in there, whatever. We're flying around in this little, tiny helicopter, right? And I'm, you know, I'm like, this is fun, sort of. <laughs> and he was the kind of guy that would, like, go like this and go like this, you know, and go like that. And one, at one point, he saw some animals, like, over a field. I don't know if they were raccoons or whatever. And he goes, watch this. And so he actually goes, we're going like this, and he goes, up like this, and he goes, yeah, like this, right toward the <laughs> animals that were on the, the thing. I thought we were going to die. I really thought we were going to die. But it was so awesome. I mean, it was like, you know what? We could die doing this, but then there's another part of me that's going, this is amazing. Right, 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 right. So, uh, so I mean, that, that's, where, that's where this whole idea of getting out of the boat has another side to it. It has this whole other side of experiencing something completely out of the ordinary that could change our life. And so tonight we're going to center on verse 29, okay? So let's go back to verse 29, all right? Verse 29 says, Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. Okay, so many times when I hear people talk about this, they center on the fact that Jesus um, sank. Like they focus on the fact that he, had just, uh, he had, didn't have enough faith, so he sank. That's where the, the story is. But here's the thing. The reality is, here's the reality about Peter. Peter experienced something that no other human being has ever experienced. He actually walked on water, right? At the core of his being, he experienced that. This is the high part of this story because of what he, in the midst of the storm and the waves and the wind and fear and failure, Peter experienced walking on water, After deciding to take this huge risk and get out of the boat, Peter experienced the joy and the power and the freedom of God. Even if it was for a few minutes. We don't know how long it took for him to do that. We don't know how far Jesus was away from him when he said, get out of the boat. Did he walk 10 feet, 2 feet, 200 feet, 300 feet? We don't know. But there was a point for Peter that he experienced the fullness of God's power 
as a result of him having the courage to get out of the boat. If only for a few minutes. Can you imagine what was going through Peter's mind as he was walking towards Jesus? Okay, I want you to put yourself in Peter's mind, okay? Um, oh my gosh. I, I can't believe it. I'm, I'm walking on the water. Uh, I didn't, in fact, I didn't really think that I would do it myself. Get out of the boat. But I did. Like, when I let go of the side of the boat, that was like the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole life. I thought I was going to sink. And as he's walking towards Jesus, he's having these thoughts. He goes, I, I thought that maybe I would even die if I did that. And look at me. I'm walking on the water. It was so crazy. I stepped out. At first, my feet were starting to get wet. And I, instead of feeling like I was going to sink, I, fe I felt something solid. And so I stepped out. This is crazy. I think, I think I'm beginning to understand. Now I'm beginning to understand now. It's true. It's true. It's true. I mean, I'm not walking any different than I have before. But I think it's true. He really is the one. Jesus is the one. I don't see how anything can be the same after this. How could it? Cannot be the same. I don't, I don't see how I could settle for life in the boat again after this. Because here's the truth about walking on the water. This is what Peter experienced. Walking on the water is exciting and inspiring and exhilarating and scary and unpredictable. But that's what Peter experienced when he got out of the water. Because in Peter's mind, he said, you know what? It was worth the risk. It's worth the risk. You know, here at TNC, there have been numerous times where God has asked us to get out of the boat. When we started this church, when we started the church, we didn't know what we were doing. We still don't know what we're doing. But all we know is, is that God called us to do this and to follow his lead, and that's what we've been doing since we started. And so when we first came to this place and we had to do renovations that had to take place here and, you know, different things that we, we, had, we were like, we didn't know where we were going to get the money. We didn't know when we, where we were going to get the volunteers. We didn't know any of that. All we knew is that God was saying, okay, you need to get out of the boat because there are some people in North Toledo that need Jesus. And you need to go. Get out of the boat. Right? When we were going to start the clinic, I remember having a conversation with uh, Paul. Um, like probably a year after we started TNC, we started to have this conversation about the clinic and how it would be a really good idea to have a clinic and all of those things. And I was so overwhelmed with everything else going on or whatever. I'm like, yeah, that's a great idea. When you get that ready to go, let me know. And so time went on, and we prayed about it, prayed about it, prayed about it. And all of a sudden, God started to raise up some people. And then we started to figure out where are we going to get the money because we had to do a bunch of renovations over at the, where the Y is in order for us to have a medical clinic there. So God was asking us, are you going to commit and get out of the boat and do this? And there was one point in time where we were like, there's no turning back. We're going forward. It's the same thing when we started Rahab's Heart. Rahab's Heart was, is a ministry that helps women out of adult prostitution. 
And when we were getting that all started and ready to go, we didn't know how that was going to happen. We didn't know how we were going to be able to get the, the center done for them. We didn't know any of that when we started it. All we knew is that God was saying, okay, I need you to get out of the boat again because there are some women whose lives are headed towards destruction and you need to come alongside and create something that will save their life. So God raised up another lady, Leanne. She's from the neighborhood that helped to get that thing all going, and we pulled the trigger and we did it. Get out of the boat. This is the same thing with the Youth Development Center. It's the same thing with the Plank Factory. I'll tell you what, you know, the, the, the different things that God has asked us to do here at TNC, um, I mean, you guys, we're a little church. And God has asked us to get out of the boat numerous times. And a lot of times it had to be with trusting him for some funds for us to do the stuff we need to get done. You know, and since we've opened up TNC, we've had to raise over a half a million dollars. That doesn't even cover our budget. Time and time and time again, God is like, are you going to get out of the boat? I need you to get out of the boat again. That's what this is about. So there's this other story about this whole thing as far as getting out of the boat. And with Peter, like, you need to understand, his feet got wet, okay? Understand that. Peter's feet did get wet, okay? So there's this other story that I want us to look at. We're gonna, um, I'm going to set this up for you. It's in the book of Joshua. Okay, um, I want you to turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 3. Okay, Joshua is uh, in the Old Testament. It's right after the book of Deuteronomy. I love saying Deuteronomy. That's a great, you know, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. Um, but the book of Joshua, we're going to go to chapter 3. Okay, so I'm going to set this up, what's going on here. Okay, so Moses dies. And Joshua is now in charge, and so God has been promising the Israelites for thousands of years, I'm going to take you to a land full of milk and honey, it's going to be great, you're going to love it, it's going to be awesome. And so now's the time, Moses is dead, Joshua's on the scene, so now Joshua's going to lead them to the promised land. But in order to do that, they have to cross the Jordan River to get to the other side so that they can go towards that promised land, all right? So, um, so, but the Jordan River is nothing to mess with, especially when it is at flood stage. And so, you know, you're thinking about, okay, how are this plus, a million plus people, how, how are they going to leave? What are they going to do? How are they going to get to the other side? How is this going to take place? All right. So listen to how God explains this to Joshua. Joshua is about ready to be asked to get out of his boat, okay? Says, uh, starting in verse 7, the Lord told Joshua, today I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. They will know that I am with you just as I was with Moses. Give them, give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop there. Okay, stop. This is their get out of the boat moment. Because if they were to experience God's power and experience that land flowing with milk and honey, um, they were going to have to take the first step and get their feet wet. They couldn't stay in the boat. All right, and then verse 15 says this. It was the harvest season, and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge. Okay, stop right there. All right, so, okay, so we can kind of get all these pictures on what the Jordan River looks like at flood stage. I actually found a video of the Jordan River at flood stage. So I want you to take a look at this river. This is what the priests were supposed to step into. Okay, look at this.
Here's the other thing you need to understand about the Tor River and drink blood tank. The depth is 50 feet and 200 feet. That's blood tank. So there are places there when you step, when you step into the Jordan River, if you step into this, you're dead. All right, you're dead. So this is the what's going on. This is when God is telling Joshua, this is what I need you to do. I need you to get out of your boat, and you're going to have to get your feet wet and step into the Jordan River. His get out of the boat moment, right? Look at verse 16. It says, the water above that point, the minute they touched that, okay, so the minute, it wasn't like they tiptoed up to the edge. They actually stepped into the water. The minute they did that, the water began backing up a great distance away from the town called Adam, which is near Zerathan, and the water below that point flowed onto the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry, and then the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. Here's a huge truth as far as getting out of the boat. Because I think sometimes we think our feet are not going to get wet. Yes, they are. In fact, if I'm going to walk on water, I got to take the first step. I got to be willing to get my feet wet first. I got to be willing to get my feet wet uh, wet first. If I'm really going to walk on water, I got to be willing to get out of the boat and get my feet wet. That's when you discover it's worth it. Not till you get out of the boat. Do you know when... Um, Moses was asked by God to lead the Israelites. When he talked with Moses, he said, you'll know that it was the one I sent you when you're standing worshiping me at the foot of this mountain. That's when you'll know. Like, after you've gotten out of your boat and you've gotten your feet wet and you've gone through all of this stuff to get to the mountain, that's when you're going to know I sent you when you're here worshiping me at the foot of the mountain, you're going to know this was God that did that. Before that happened, though, Moses had to get his feet wet. This guy named Naaman, he, got, he had to wash seven times in a river before he was cured of leprosy. Seven times. He had to get out of his boat, get himself literally wet seven times before he was cured of leprosy. Gideon had to narrow his army down from 32,000 to 300. From three, 32,000 to 300 before he was able to defeat the Midianites. That was his boat. Five loaves and two fish. Remember that story? Okay, those five loaves and two fish had to be given away in order for thousands of people to be fed. That was their boat, right? That was their boat. This isn't just a spiritual principle, like, but this is a life principle. This is what I need you to understand tonight. This is a life principle on how you live your life. If you want to grow and change, and create a better future, you have to get your feet wet. You have to. It's not going to happen otherwise. Okay, so at this point, you might be saying, okay, well, all right, Pastor Pat, you know what? I don't think I have enough faith to step out of the boat. I, I don't know. That's, it's hard. I don't think I have enough faith to do that. Okay, I want to show you a little bit of an example about how Jesus views this whole thing of faith. I think we've got this kind of screwed up a little bit. 
Because, see, the reality is for us, you know what we think we need when we're going to step out of the boat? We think we need this, this much faith. This is what we think. We think, if I'm going to step out and risk stuff, I think my faith has to be like this. Because it's, unless it's like this, I don't think I'm going to be able to get out of the boat. Right? Here's the only problem with that reasoning. It's not biblical. In fact, uh, some of you, hopefully all of you, have a little thing called a mustard seed. Can you pull that out right now? Pull it out. Okay? If you can find it. <laughs> So I want you to look at this ball, and I want you to look at the mustard seed, okay? Right, so there's this story about Jesus having this conversation with his um, disciples. And uh, they, were, they couldn't cast out a demon from somebody. They were kind of frustrated. And so Jesus wanted to encourage them because they kind of thought, we just don't have what it takes. And so Jesus goes, whoa, 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 you need to understand something. You don't need this kind of faith to get out of the boat. Do you know what kind of faith you need? This, right here. This is enough for you to get out of the boat is right here. Because, see, for Peter... For Peter, when he got out of the boat, this is how much he had when he got out of the boat. Right here. Okay? That's probably why when he got out of the boat and he was walking in the water and he started to focus on all the waves and the storm and the wind instead of Jesus, that he started to falter because this is what he had. <coughs> all right? And that's when Jesus grabbed him, kept him from sinking, right? Right? Oh, yeah, and by the way, he also probably carried him back to the boat. And so here's the truth for tonight. This is a life principle for you. Okay, listen up. When God is calling you to do something, when, when you know that you want to make some changes in your life, you want to go to the next place, all right, this isn't what it takes. This is what it takes, okay? And so as I look at the difference between this and this, I'm like, I think I can do this. I think I can do this. Because God, he's got us, doesn't he? Right? He's got us. So I, I okay, okay. Let me just ask you some questions here about this, okay? Um, what are some of those things that actually cause us to get out of the boat? Faith? What's that? Curiosity. That's a good one. How about frustration? Stress? Um... How about if you're really frustrated with the current state of your life? Could you get frustrated enough where you go, I got to get out of the boat? Right? Um, that was Nehemiah. Nehemiah, his whole hometown was destroyed. He couldn't. He went and looked at it. He couldn't take it. So he was like, I am so frustrated with what this is. I'm going to get out of the boat, and we got to do something to fix this, okay? How about, how about waves of compassion, right? How about when you just feel so much compassion about something? You're like, I got to do something. I don't know what it is, but I got to do something. That's the story of the Good Samaritan, Right? Where the guy was going to, from Jericho to Jerusalem and he, then he got robbed and all the religious guys passed him by. And here comes a, good, a guy from Samaria and he came and he saw him and he had compassion. And he goes, I'm going to get out of the boat. Okay. 
How about prayer? About something, and then God just put something on you so much you couldn't do anything but do something. I gotta read something to you. This is a true story. Listen to what this says. Um, he goes, one of my favorite adventures is in prayer involves Doug Coe, who has a ministry in Washington, D.C. that mostly involves people in politics. Doug became acquainted with this guy named Bob. Bob is an insurance salesman, okay, who was completely unconnected with any government circles, right? He's just a normal guy. I sell insurance. So Bob became a Christian and began to meet with Doug to learn about his new faith. One day, Bob came in all excited about a statement in the Bible where Jesus said, Ask whatever you will in my name and you will receive it. And so Bob goes, Is that true? He demanded, right? Doug explained, Well, it's not a blank check. You have to take into context of the teaching of the whole scripture on prayer. But yes, it really is true. Jesus really does answer prayer. Great, Bob said. Then I got to start praying for something. I think I'm going to pray for Africa. <laughs> That's kind of a broad target. Why don't you narrow it down to one country, Doug advised. All right. I'll pray for Kenya. I'll pray for Kenya. Do you know anybody in Kenya? Doug asked. No. Ever been to Kenya? Nope. Bob just wanted to pray for Kenya. So Doug made an, unre uh, an unusual arrangement. He goes, okay, look. If you agree to me to pray for Kenya for six months, okay, if God does something in that six months, I'll pay you $500. And if he doesn't, then you pay me $500. Or no. No, if he does, yeah, he's going to pay him $500. If he doesn't, then you know what I mean. Never mind. <laughs> okay, so anyway, so here's the agreement, all right? And so Bob did, he prayed every single day for Kenya. Didn't know anybody, never been there, da-da-da. Okay, so Bob began to pray for a long time, nothing happened. Then one night, he was at a dinner in Washington. The people around the table explained what they did for a living. One woman said she helped run an orphanage in Kenya, the largest orphanage in Kenya. Bob saw $500 suddenly sprout wings and began to fly away. But he could not keep quiet. Bob roared to life. He had not said much up to this point, and now he pounded her relentlessly with question after question after question. So you're obviously very interested in my country, the woman said to Bob, overwhelmed by a sudden barrage of questions. You been to Kenya before? No. You know someone in Kenya? No. Then how do you happen to be so curious? Well, it's kind of, this guy's kind of paying me $500 to, pay, to pray for Kenya, okay? So she asked Bob if he would like to come visit Kenya and tour the orphanage. Bob was so eager to go, he would have left that night if he could. When Bob arrived in Kenya, <clears throat> it's crazy, he was appalled by the poverty and the lack of basic health care Upon returning to Washington, he couldn't get the place out of his mind. He began to write to large pharmaceutical companies, describing to them the vast need he has seen. He reminded them that every year they would throw away large amounts of medical supplies that went unsold. Why not send them to a place, this place in Kenya? And some of them did. The orphanage received more than a million dollars worth of medical supplies that next year. The woman called up Bob and said, Bob, this is amazing. We've had the most phenomenal gifts because of the letters you wrote. We'd like to fly you back and have a big party. Would you come? So Bob flew back to Kenya while he was there. The president of Kenya came to the celebration because it was the largest orphanage in the country and offered to take Bob on a tour of Nairobi, the capital city. In the course of the tour, they saw a prison. 
Bob asked about a group of prisoners there. Uh, they're political prisoners, he told them. That's a bad idea, Bob said brightly. Huh, you should let them out. Bob finished the tour, flew back home. Sometime later, Bob, Bob received a phone call from the State Department of the United States government. Uh, is this Bob? Yes. Were you recently in Kenya? Yes. Did you make any statements to the president about political prisoners? Yes. What did you say? I told him he should let them go. The State Department official explained that the department had been working for years to get the release of these prisoners to no avail. Normal diplomatic channels and political maneuverings had led to a dead end, now, but now the prisoners had been released. And the State Department was told it had been largely because of Bob. So the government was calling to say thanks. Oh, it doesn't stop there. Several months later, the president of Kenya made a phone call to Bob. He was going to rearrange his government and select new cabinet. Would Bob be willing to fly over and pray for him for three days while he worked on this very important task? So Bob, who was not politically connected at all, boarded a plane once more, flew back to Kenya where he prayed and asked God to give wisdom for the leader of the nation as he selected his government all that because one man chose to get out of his boat. Here are some things water walk, walking on water requires. Okay, you ready? Here we go. These are my challenges for you for this week. The first one. You need to ask yourself this question. What am I doing that I could not do apart from the power of God? What am I doing that I could not do from the power of what if it was not for the power of God? What is it? I'll tell you right now, you know, the whole thing with the plank factory. God has asked me to get out of the boat numerous times with that thing. And unless God comes through with the plank factory or like he's come through with the clinic or like he's come through with the youth development center, we're screwed. Here's another one. Instead of trying hard to have more faith, try hard to get to know God better. Instead of trying hard to have faith, Try hard to get to know God better. Do you know why Peter was willing to get out of the boat? Because he knew Jesus. That's why. And his faith was like this. But it didn't have to do with the amount of faith he had. It all had to do with the person that he knew. That's what it's about. It'd be like you going to Yosemite um, National Park or wherever it is. Where's, um, where's Old Faithful? Did I say that right? Yosemite, right? Okay, thanks. Okay. So anyway, so Yosemite, and you're like, you know what? I just, I really, uh, I don't know if I can have faith in that Old Faithful thing. I'm not real sure. I don't know if that's really true. And uh, then the person goes, you know what? All you got to do is hang around it for a while. You'll know it's very consistent. It goes off at a certain time every single day. And so once you know what it's really like and what it really does, guess what? Mm, it's going to be, you can, you'll have faith in Old Faithful, right? Get to know God better. And then lastly, this is a challenge for you this week for this last next um, six months, okay? Choose an area of the world, a cause, or a need bigger than yourself to pray for during the next six months. 
and I'm not going to pay you $500 if God does something. <laughs> but I will let you give a testimony. That's for darn sure. Okay, for the next six months, this is my challenge to you, okay? Choose an area of the world, a cause, or a need bigger than yourself to pray for during the next six months. See what God does. Because right? here's the thing, okay? God designed us to get out of the boat. Because I don't know about you, but when, I get, when I'm done here, when I'm done with my life, I want to know that I didn't spend my life st uh, stuck in the boat. I want to know that I was willing to get out of the boat again and again and again and again, even if I failed. I want to know that I didn't waste my life. I got out of the boat. That's my prayer for you tonight. All right, let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for Peter's example. Father, it is. It's exciting. It's exhilarating. It's scary. It's unpredictable to get out of the boat and to trust you and to step out in faith. And to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. It's scary to get out of the boat and to do something different and to make different choices. But that's the only way we're going to grow and experience the reality of who you are. So I pray for all of us, Jesus, the rest of this week, this coming week, as we're praying about these things, as we're thinking about these things, as we're asking you about these things, I pray that we would focus on the fact that we've all of us have faith of a mustard seed. That's all we need. Give us the courage to step out of the boat. Would you be our provision, our protection this week? Help us to be salt and light to people that were around. Thank you for loving us. In the authority of Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. All right, if you brought an offering, make sure you put it in the joy box in the back. All right? And uh, food pantry is this coming Wednesday.